president of the New Park Area Historical Society, and we're so excited to see such a great crowd out here tonight. A little louder, sorry. Thanks, Marsha. We're so excited to see a great crowd out here tonight um, to, for our train event. Um, shortly here, we'll have Dennis Dvorak coming up to speak on the 1906 crash that happened um, here in New Prague, um, in which five people were killed. And after that, we are very fortunate to have Jeff and George from Gopher State Railway Museum here today to talk about their museum and their program and all the activities they have going on there. So um, it should be a really great event tonight. A couple things I wanted to mention before we get started. Um, I just wanted to mention uh, these events that we put on aren't possible without the support of our patrons. Um, if you're interested in becoming a patron, it's $25 a year. There's a couple ways to do that. We've got um, our website that you can go to and um, we've got some business cards on the table. You're welcome to take those home with you and you can go to our website and um, join there. I also printed off a QR code which I know some people might not be familiar with it, but if you're not, all you do is you take um, the camera from your phone and you hover it over the image and it'll pop up a little pop-up on your screen. And you can click on that pop-up and it brings you to our support page if you would like to become a patron that way. And there is also paper copies to become a patron this way. And we've got Tom and Donna up there at our welcome table and they'd love to chat with you guys more about becoming a patron. Uh, we also have um, an open board position. If anybody is interested in history and loves to help create events and learn more about history and help us preserve it and help continue our mission of collecting, preserving, and disseminating um, the history of our local communities, we'd love to have you as a member. You're welcome to talk to me. Um, there's also Tom and Donna up at the table and Kelsey. We've got several board members here. We'd love to chat with you about more about what that's about. Um, we also have... Um, Oh, for those of you, we have a summer series coming up here. I'm going to have Kelsey come up here in just a moment to talk about that. We've got several events coming up this summer that will be lots of fun. And um, we do advertise all of those events on, um, we've got the bank board over at um, the First Bank and Trust and Midwest Bank. We send out emails. Um, we also advertise in the local paper and we send flyers around town. We do also use social media. If you do not use social media and you still want to follow our feed, if you go to our website and you scroll to the bottom of the main page there, you can see our social media feed so you can still keep up to date with the um, historic information we share about our communities. So you're welcome to do that um, at your leisure. And I will switch over to Kelsey here. She's going to talk to you about a few programs we have coming up this summer. All right, I am going to talk about a couple of things, like Kristen said, that we have coming up. The first one is a bowling alley self-guided tour of the bowling alley that's atop the, um, it's now Honey Lou Boutique, but it was Cedar and Sage. So it was called the Thompson's, Thompson's Bowling Alley and Pool Hall. Um, they've cleaned up the area. It was a bit of a mess, I guess. Um, Kristen went up there, and now they... I think it's like three preserved lanes and the machines, so you can come up and look at that. The owner of the building has a lot of history on the building, so she'll be there to share anything that she knows and answer questions. And if you have any memories of working at the bowling alley or going to it or family members who did, please bring those because we want to have a little area where you guys can tell stories, share pictures, um, or any memorabilia you have. And so that will be on June 5th from 5.30 to 7. Then we have a garden tour on July 13th. This is going to be focusing on gardening, gardening and agriculture in our area. So each of the stops will have tidbits of information of historical, whatever the feature is of that garden. So like some gardens, I'm like going in a, like a spot. Some gardens will have somebody there talking about a historical topic. Some will have maybe a demo. Donna might do a demo on how to make sauerkraut with some old implements um, and just different things like that to make it fun. And so there's about 12 gardens that are available for you guys to look at. And then we will have a speaker. Um, Dennis will speak and then master gardeners will speak afterwards about gardening in the area and agriculture. And then lunch will be available for purchase at that as well. Um, we'll have 
we'll need volunteers at each garden. So if you guys are interested in being a volunteer, we'll have a little kind of training as to what we want you to do while you're there. But if you want to volunteer, talk to Donna or Tom and we'll get your information for that. That is July 13th from nine to one. Uh, then we have Checkout New Prague, which is our uh, yearly, I don't know really, open house in the cabin. They have a lot of vendors. That is August 1st from five to eight. And then Greg Dukalski is gonna do a really cool trolley tour. Um, his walking tours of New Prague are always interesting and so he's gonna combine them into a trolley tour. So that will leave from here on the Sunday of Dozinki. It'll be 45 minutes to an hour and then come back here and drop people off. And we'll do, are we doing three tours? Four tours? I don't know, three, three tours. Um, and those will be $30 a ticket. So watch our website for, and Facebook for signups for those and purchase the tickets online. Um, if you do wanna purchase tickets not online, again, talk to us and we'll get that figured out. Anything else? Okay, we're gonna switch our slide up here. It'll be just a moment. Uh, Dennis will be in here in just a moment. We'll get started. First, I'm talking about the 1906 train wreck, and after that, we'll have Gopher State Railway Museum come up and discuss their uh, museum. So it'll be just a moment. I'll pass this. Dennis is here. We will start our presentation with the 1906 train wreck, and Dennis, we were able to get an image up here on our slideshow too, also for you to uh, reference if you would like. Thank you. Excuse my, my delay. I've had some issues that I have to deal with. Aging, you know what that is all about? <laughs> First of all, I want to welcome you and thank you for coming this evening. I worked uh, long and hard getting this information together, and uh, it was spurred by the suggestion that <clears throat> we invite the Gopher Museum to come and share the evening. And, and somewhere along the line, I had come across the 1906 train wreck and wanted to tell you about it. And uh, I have to, addendum to this story is how grateful I am to the New Prague Times and the 150 odd years that they've been in existence. And with so many of our local communities losing their newspapers, we still retain ours. So in your... Whatever you can do to subscribe to the New Prague Times or buy whatever you can do to support them, it's a very important part of our community and without them, history would have been lost a long time ago. And today, because every day we're creating history. I also want to thank Joan Wynn and uh, Don Kahn for sharing the items that are used in the exhibit at the library. If you haven't stopped in to see that, please do. Um, the locomotives are push locomotives that preceded the train track locomotives the children played with. <laughs> That's, thank you. The American train is uh, an icon of our history and our community as well as the United States and due to the rise of the automobile and everyone wanted to go, wanting to go their own way at their own time in their own place, we've lost a very important part of our culture and it's very difficult to regain. It's, it's regaining slowly, as I saw the new Amtrak going between Minneapolis and Chicago, but it's, a, it's really a terrible loss because everywhere my wife and I have traveled in Japan and in Eastern Europe and Central Europe and Turkey and United, United Kingdom, there were trains. And it gave the, the average person an opportunity to get from A to B at a very nominal fee. Everyone has somewhat of a nostalgia toward trains, and I know that I do. And uh, books that I read, or I read to my children, The Little Engine That Could, Murder on the Orient Express by Agatha Christie, I'm sure you're familiar with that was made into movies as well. The Great Train Robbery, The Polar Express, and Throw Mama from the Train are just a few that, I, that come to mind that, uh, that embrace the train experience. For myself, it was a train ride to South Dakota to visit my sister for a summer stay in the 50s. And I suppose my parents were really anxious to get rid of me. And not knowing what to do, we put it on a train, and I recall my mother saying, 
along the way because the train car, passenger car, had kerosene lamps lining both sides of the passenger train. That I wonder if the Indians are going to attack. And I saw these on the Saturday morning serials, uh, the, the Western shows, when the Indians were always attack, attacking the trains or vice versa. In any event, uh, for our community in May of 18, 1949, as reported recently in the New Prague Times history section, nightly passenger trains number three and four on the, Min on the Minneapolis and St. Louis were discontinued Monday, and these trains were shifted to the schedule of number one northbound, leaving New Prague at 4.54 p.m. daily. Now, I might have put the p.m. instead of a.m. because in my discussions and talking to a variety of New Prague citizens, such as Ginny Mahole, they all got on the train at five in the morning. That was northbound from Minneapolis. Recently, as maybe you know, Marilyn Rehor Sindelar Bednar died on last Monday, and I t interviewed her a week and a half ago, and we talked at length about her love to go on the train in the early morning, go shopping at Dayton's, never stopping for lunch or a movie. It was just one end of Nicollet Avenue to the other to shop, which for items that New Prague didn't have or just to look. Peg Novotny Topka, who is 98 years old, Maryland is 92, so I was kind of focusing on the, old, the older population. Peg Novotny, to Novotny Topka went to Minneapolis with her friend Loretta Slotik. And Loretta's father was a dentist here. His fingers were as big as sausages and they smelled like fish, I was told. And uh, <laughs> I went to the dentist today and I, I, <laughs> I started to chuckle there now exam. Both uh, Peg and Loretta lost track of time and they missed their train home. So what do you do? Well, are any relatives of uh, Peg here this evening? Good. Because they never got home. They met some young guy who took them to his parents' home and they stayed overnight. She's never told this to her children. And <laughs> she chuckled and chuckled and chuckled her way through the conversation a lovely and delightful person, still living independently in, in Minnetonka. Lucille Nikolai took the train to visit her sister in, in uh, Montgomery. Now remember, there were no passable roads most of the season. They were all mud. One woman that really stands out in my mind took a train trip to Minneapolis, and because she only spoke Bohemian and there was a language barrier, she couldn't figure out how to get home and explain to the ticket agent where she wanted to go. Speaking Bohemian, and he speaking only English, or maybe German or Scandinavian, who knows, she thought, well, what do I do? So she remembered those knickers that she made from the flower sacks from the Seal of Minnesota flour mill. She lifted up her long skirt, bared her knickers, and there in front was Seal of Minnesota, New Prague, she pointed to New Prague, she got the ticket home, and she survived. <laughs> Minneapolis and St. Louis, uh, uh, Louis passenger trains uh, made four to six trips uh, through New Prague daily, beginning in 1877. Now, can you imagine what a, an event this was? It just transformed this community. And uh, the tr first train rides were 10 cents. Um, I remember taking the bus in Minneapolis to high school uh, for 10 cents, and that was a real deal. But uh, taking a train to Minneapolis for that amount was even more so. The Minneapolis and St. Louis Railroad was headquartered in St. Louis Park, and it was founded by the Pillsbury and the Washburn milling families to transport wheat from the rural areas to be ground into flour in the Millie District along the Mississippi River in downtown Minneapolis. So it was a, a generated business that really served everyone well. The first and final run uh, of the trains occurred in, uh, was in 1959-1960. I have, I've found two different dates. But I know my wife Linda remembers as a kid living on just down the street from the train depot. She remembers the trains coming through New Prague as well as others. It was an event. 
The trains put New Prague and the International Milling on the map. It became the bread and butter city of southern Minnesota. And it was one of four places that only had a phone in the depot, which was built by the St. Louis and Minneapolis and St. Louis Railroad. They were one of four that had phones around the turn of the century. The other was the Malonic Mill, where High V is located on the west side of town. The dispatch office, which was connected to the Proshek Hotel, the International Hotel on Main Street, and the New Prague Times. So again, the New Prague Times has been the source of information for many, many decades. The salesman's, salesman uh, that primarily traveled that train um, and utilized it for business um, arrived on Monday, on the Monday train. And um, they stayed at the International Hotel, the Broge Hotel, the Klondike across from the mill, the Remish Hotel or the Commercial Hotel uh, near the train depot. And they would rent horses and buggies from the Tom Kubish livery stable, which is up the hill going west out of town, recently for sale. And in each of those hotels, there were sample rooms. And each sample room had a place where the salesmen could display all their items. The Broge Hotel was managed by the Mussel family, relatives of Mr. Wenceslas Broge. And the Mussels had seven kids. So you can imagine what an active place that was. When the salesman came in, the furnace was the, the wood fireplace, the pot belly stoves were fired up, the chickens were retrieved from the chicken coop behind the hotel, heads chopped off, freshly served in the kitchen. And when the salesman left on Friday, the fire went out, the chickens all went back to laying eggs. <laughs> Everyone was happy, well fed, until the next week when the new round of salesmen arrived. Can you imagine the sound of the train whistle when it coming through town? When all along Main Street, it was the jingle and jangle of reins from the horses and buggies and the, the horses that maybe whined and the excitement of that was generated along Main Street. In fact, when Montgomery built their train depot, it was called Whistle. And in talking, in, uh, talking to some residents, early residents, they said New Montgomery was essentially known and called Whistle. Never Montgomery, just Whistle, and you, the, the train will be coming. Well, you're all here to hear about the big disaster. And uh, it generates a lot of imagery. It happened in the morning of September 24th, 1906, the year my father was born. And so that seems like a long time ago. The train engine number seven left Jordan at 11 a.m. And this is the Minneapolis-St. Louis train. It was 15 minutes late leaving, and it consisted of a baggage car, a smoking car, two day coaches, and an observation buffet car. The train was clocked at 15 to 25 miles an hour, traveling on the track toward New Craig, racing as it went, where it ended up striking the rear end of a tender north of the train depot after rounding to the corner by the creek, probably in the area where um, Chart is located. I've driven by there many times and trying to establish some imagery of that, where that train wreck occurred, but it was a little bit north of the, the depot and probably the stockyards. Upon impact, before impact, the conductor tried to engage the air brakes, but they failed to engage and work. But the fortunate thing was the train never left the tracks. That probably saved a lot of lives. The passenger train had the right-of-way, and there were two switches. One opens on the house tracks and the other on the passing track, and the freight train in the yard was standing on the house track pushing three cars when it came in contact with the passenger train. The, the freight train, when it was struck, hurled three cars forward over two blocks into New Prague. Now you can imagine the collision. As I said, the passenger train had the right of way. The passenger train, it was, their, their locomotive was completely demolished, as well as the other at a cost of about $30,000 each. So this was not five and dime. 
The engineer, McDonald, was thrown from the freight train cab and ended up near the creek. He was heavily scalded from the steam and he prayed to die. Fireman Kilmeyer was thrown out from the cab, burned and crushed on the opposite side of the freight engine and died at approximately 5.30 p.m. that same day. One of the injured passengers described the crash as a cyclone after the first explosion, creating a dust storm which filled the air with dirt. Afterwards, the injured were taken and retrieved and taken to the Broge Hotel where they were treated. They were treated in the sample room. Now the sample room today is the bar and that had step up display areas from the front door to the step up door that goes into the back and that's where Mr. Broge lived. The doctors from New Prague and Jordan tend to the injured. The dead were taken to City Hall where it was turned into a temporary morgue, or to so to speak. Many people helped along the way. One that stood out was Myrtle Vincent of the Vincent Opera Company and her companion, Goldie. They took care of the charge of the buffet car and made coffee and tea for workers. And to assist the doctors, they tore their slips and undergarments into strips to make bandages. Now remember, we're in an era where there wasn't a hospital. There was a drugstore, and that uh, was uh, uh, utilized as well by Mrs. Durand, who ran down to the Makishka drugstore to retrieve absorbent cotton and disinfectants. That drugstore is no longer standing. It's the patio next to, I think it's, it's called a Local 101. Is that the, the, the little restaurant on Main Street? A 105. Oh, sorry. Wrong number. Yeah. In any event, um, they were very instrumental and became rather became celebrities, as printed in the New Prague Times. Those in the that died in the train wreck, um, there were five. Uh, Frank Robick, he was age six, seventeen. Now I was utilizing not only the New Prague Times but also Gail Anderson's book on the history of uh, Jordan, who also commented on these, this, this incident. So the dates or the times uh, and the ages may vary, so uh, don't hold me to it. But uh, anyway, he was assistant bain, a grain buyer and he was the son of uh, Frank Horavik who built uh, the Klondike Hotel as a place for salesmen to stay and it was also, they had, uh, it was a saloon. Um, one person described it as a brothel, one of the previous owners of the building. But I've never caught that. I don't think uh, the priest at St. Wentz would have allowed it. In any event, Frank was caught between the tender, the first locomotive, and the passenger locomotive. And instantly died. Another one was Delford Murray, and he, was, he lived at Lake of the Isles Boulevard. I mean, this is not a slum area. Lake of the Isles is the highbrow area of Minneapolis. He was a traveling salesman for the Wayne Partridge Company. He was a Civil War vet and he was survived by three sons and two daughters. Another was Frank Brown. He was a traveling agent for the Foot Schultze Shoe Company of St. Paul, which was the forerunner of the Red Rings Shoe Company. Frank Klinker, Klinkerfuss of St. Paul. He was a traveling agent for the Gutzen Shoe Company, where it was reputed the, the shoe fits like your footprint. Another was Elk. Arthur Kilmeyer of Albert Lee, he was the fireman on the ill-fated train and he died at four o'clock. Again, there's a dispute in terms of time. All the passengers in that smoking car were playing cards. A baggage car plowed through the smoker, killing the men instantly, having sustained head injuries. Total, there were probably 20 to 30 that were killed in that train accident. They had Badly lacerated faces, fractured and bas badly lacerated arms, spine injuries, wrist broken, leg bruised. And the only girl on that train was Faye Brewer. She was age 14. And uh, she was described as the only woman on the train, so we should, I should digress and call her a woman. She was sitting in the front of the passenger coach 
next to the smoker car. Her right arm was heavily bruised. She was sitting with her daughter, her sister Florence, and they were traveling from Seattle, Washington to relatives living in Pleasant Valley, Iowa, after their mother committed suicide a few weeks earlier. They patched her up as best as they could. They continued, they continued on their journey in the evening, riding on another passenger car. The injured from Minneapolis, um, one was interesting was Frank Plumley. He had two crushed legs and he was tossed from the coach. Uh, another was H.A. Johnson. He also had two crushed legs. Another was G.A. McLean, and he worked for a candy company. When his two legs were injured and crushed, they had to take and cut and broke the legs of the adjoining person that was covering his body in order to get him out. So it was a rather labor-intensive and traumatic situation. George Mertens of New Prague had a leg that was broken. He was taken to his sister, Mrs. Frank Heinen, to recover. And this happened to many of these injured that I'm uh, referring to as among, among, as among others that I'm not going to tell you about, but the, pe the people in New Prague opened up their homes. The ones that were able to walk in or to be carried in, they were cared for until arrangements were made to send them back to where they lived. The people that helped in the rescue of these injured were Reverend Pomier, the head priest at uh, St. Wentz, John F. Brujic, member of the Hospital Corps in the Philippines, Ben Vanasik, John Spencer, Miss and Mrs. Dick Clare, Pat Vertish, one of the earliest families in New Prague, Mary Lukish, Dr. Orr, who was a local physician. The townspeople really, as I mentioned, pitched in to help. They went to the train site in swarms, as the photographs here behind me show. And these photographs were donated from a family album. Um, and the great-grandfather worked at uh, the International Milling Company. Now, to have a handheld camera during this time and to transport it and be able to pay by film and have it developed was a rarity because most photographs during this time were taken with view cameras. The ones that you see in the old Wild West days, they're on a tripod, the photographer sits down, he puts a big black cloth over his head, and that's because the viewfinder was very bright, and they had to put the glass, the cover of the black cloth to cover them and the viewfinder in order to see what they were focusing on. So they went down there in swarms, as it was indicated, and they were asked to please stay away. And you'll see the, in the photographs exactly what I'm talking about, there were scavengers, both men, women, and children, who entered the train wreck, passenger cars, pursuit, looking for souvenirs. And when the injured were finally transported back home, they checked their pockets, and many of them had the money, they had no money left in their pockets. They were taken during the convalescence and wherever they were. So that was kind of a uh, sad note on I guess it goes back to the old thing, what's mine is mine, what yours is mine. And uh, no matter, we always take to think of our community as a good uh, community with good Christian values. Somehow that lost its way. They lost their way. They even ripped open cushions in the passenger cars looking for souvenirs. The coroner jur coroner's jury t found that after viewing the scene and hearing the witnesses and interviewing them, that it was a train wreck was a product of carelessness of both the freight train and the passenger train. You be the judge. You can only, we were not there, but you can only imagine the trauma and the chaos that occurred. The photographs here are really fantastic. They're, they're a treasure. They really record the event clearly. Some of them sued the, the uh, railroad. One of the injured sued the railroad for 20000 another uh, for 8000 and another for 7,500. Whether they were successful, I do not know. The story of the train wreck was even printed in ink in San Jose, California, Mercury newspaper, September 28, 1906. So it went, it went a long way. Train wrecks were numerous. And the St. Louis Railroad had another one uh, near Chaska, and one near Butterfield. 
there was another collision in Jordan. And so the speed of the train, the frequency of the train in human air caused a lot, a lot of issues. One of the stories that uh, I found really uh, troubling was, um, it, was a, it preceded this train wreck. It was in 1886 in Scott County. The Scott County Commissioner was requested to come to New Prague and assist in taking an injured black man about 25 years of age from a train wreck incident. The man boarded the freight train in New Prague and the, custer, the conductor forced him from the car some distance from the depot while the train was in rapid motion. In falling from the car, his leg fell on the rail and the car passed over it below the knee, crushing it in a horrible manner. The man asked for a farmer nearby to shoot him as he did not want to live any longer. The farmer denied his request, bound the wounded limb with his suspenders to stop the bleeding, and he was brought to town where the railroad company furnished medical assistance. The leg was eventually amputated. Mr. Collender, who was the commissioner, ordered him sent to the county poorhouse. And remember, at this time, there was a black man employed at the mill. In conclusion, I'm sure that many of you probably have grandchildren or children, and if you want to expose them to the, the culture of trains, there's Choo Choo Bob's in the Union Station in St. Paul that recently re was relocated. I used to take my grandsons to Choo Choo Bob's on Selby around the corner where they lived. There is the Minnesota Transportation Museum in, in St. Paul. Uh, you can hop on the train in Osceola, Wisconsin, on uh, the Duluth Zephyr, Zephyr, excuse me, and take the North Shore Scenic Railroad. And the music and pizza train at certain times of year from Duluth, and the two harbors turn from New from uh, from Duluth as well, or go to Osceola, or go to Wisconsin Dells. Maybe you have done so. But anyway, this gives you a little window in uh, in a very uh, dramatic and uh, sad situation that many people, majority, were able to recover from. Of and of course, some did not. But it's part of our history. And again, I want to reiterate the importance of having a vehicle for these stories to be told. And I want to thank the New Prague Times for continuing their, their uh, business and in, in informing us. So thank you. Are there any questions? Yes. As a great presentation, Dennis, I appreciate this. So if, if the trains in those days were behind schedule, who made the decision to try to catch up? Was well, that the engineer's decision? Yeah. Uh, correct me, the engineer or the conductor, one of the two, whoever is in charge. Did you have a comment? Do you agree it was the engineer or the conductor? Yeah. The engineer, the engineer yeah. Yeah, it, uh, somebody had, someone had to make the decision. And uh, so, you know, me first, you know, that mentality, we see that on the highway, right? So get out of my way or, I'm out, or you're, you're, there'll be consequences. Nevertheless, that was the decision. Any other comments or experiences? How many of you have taken the train? Excuse me. I've taken a train. All good experiences? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a nostalgic thing. It's a wonderful way to travel. Den oh, sorry, Dennis. Sorry to interrupt. I think, did you have a question, George? Yeah, I was curious. I want to show the other additional pictures, maybe. Yep. We oh, have yep. Yeah, they're showing up nicely on the screen. Thank you for doing that. There was a few other photos that we had, and we just kind of kept up the one for everybody to see. Uh, but here's a few other additional photos. Um, these photos are also up here up front, so afterwards. I know the, the light makes it a little tricky to see them. Uh, so, but if it is something that you want to see a little closer, all these images are up front as well. So I'll just give you a minute here to take a look at those. The... Was it, uh, was it on this board here, ma'am? Yes. So this one is the Gopher State Railway Museum okay, uh, photos? question is this. Yep. That's a pretty new vehicle. That's this one here? 
These, this is their current museum. Yep. No, no, this is the current Gopher State Railway Museum. Actually, that's a great segue. I mean, is there, and we'll bring them up and they'll be able to kind of share it with you a little bit more about what their museum does and what that's all about. Is there any other questions that anybody has about the 1906 crash um, from Dennis? Because we can pass around a microphone and do those. Okay, uh, without further ado, I'm gonna bring Jeff and George up. Jeff and George are from Gopher State. Oh, yes, let's, round of applause for Dennis, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Dennis. We appreciate everything and the research that you've done. Thank you very much. Uh, Jeff and George, if you guys want to come up and sure. um, we will get their stuff started. If you guys want to just do a quick sound check, make sure everybody can hear you. Test, test. Check, check. Hello? Hello. Great. Everybody hear us okay? Yeah. So I'm George. This is Jeff. Hi, I'm Jeff, Vice and President and of the Gopher State Railway Museum. And that completes our presentation. No. Uh, <laughs> thanks for coming. So, so no, this table here is sort of examples of our summer equipment, uh, brochures of the museum, and these are some of the volunteers and stuff we've done over the years. So this is separate from the, this is more the, the train wreck display here. So, all right, um, well, I'm a volunteer at Gopher State Railroad Museum. It's about two and a half miles north of New Prague, our 21 there. So, um, established in 1990. Um, yeah, and then we moved out here in about 2008. I think, Jeff, you probably know a little more about, you want to give a little, where you start out in Chaska and that kind of stuff, or? Sure, yeah, initially the museum had kind of worked on uh, num looking at a number of different locations around uh, the Twin Cities area to locate, including places like Monticello, Cologne, different places. Uh, ultimately, uh, we were working in Chaska, and there was a change in kind of the city government there as far as their view of um, the railroad in town and everything, and, and it went from being very accepting of having a museum there. The new city government said, well, why would we want a railroad museum here? We don't even want the railroad here. And at that time, the only customer left on the line, the line ended at, it was this track that runs through town out here, and it went up to Chaska, and that was the end of the line, and there's a sugar company up there where the museum was going to be located there. In the meantime, there was a group of folks between Jordan, Montgomery, New Prague, Lonsdale, the surrounding area, some business people that were looking to promote tourism and they had contacted the Union Pacific Railroad. They wanted to run a dinner train out of here. And the Union Pacific had told them, well, no, you, we're not gonna let you do that, but you should talk to these guys in Chaska, they're trying to form a museum. And uh, we ended up out here, they showed us some property and we said, well, yeah, well, why not? It's a nice, nice community and a nice place to be be part of and uh, so yeah. about 2008 that's when we started really kind of developing the property out there I guess my question would be how many I'm imagining most of people live here or nearby how many people even are aware that we're even there or have been driven by so at least you, you know where we are because one problem we have is we're kind of good at hiding in plain sight <laughs> um, which is one reason why we're here tonight to talk to you folks we've been doing what we can to get kind of the word out to about the museum, oh. um, and we are a nonprofit, five hundred one c. So it's all just volunteers and, and donations. Is and a lot of the equipment has been uh, donated to us over the years from multiple different places. So, and then our website. Um, look back on the Yep, grsm. dot org is our website. So, and for you folks that do follow social media. We do have a Facebook page. We're up to, I think, almost 2,600 followers on our Facebook page. So you can look us up on Facebook if that's something you do, if you follow social media. And we're pretty good at uh, keeping that updated. Our website is more or less information about the museum and how you can donate and things like that. Uh, most of our activities, are, we, it's easier to update Facebook than to get log onto the website and try and navigate through all the way to up add pictures and things of like that. So social media has been very handy for for that. So if you're interested in following our progress out there, follow us on Facebook. Yeah, so our mission statement uh, at Gopher State Railroad Museum is to educate the public through collection, preservation, restoration, display, and operation of railroad equipment artifacts. So we do have a um, short uh, stretch of track that we have a locomotive with a caboose that we go back and give, give rides. So. 
So collection. So this was, um, Jeff, you want to elaborate on this? Sure. So we, we have a number of pieces of rare equipment out, out at the museum that we've collected over a period of time. This photo just is last summer. Uh, if anybody was in town last summer, you might have seen these two pieces pass through town. For years, they were stored down in Montgomery. Um, just because our little short section of a track is not connected to the Union Pacific Railroad. So everything has to arrive by truck. We like to railroad the hard way. Um, so these items were stored down there. They were kind of isolated and landlocked down there. We were finally able to get them moved up here last summer with the help of Vicks Crane and the Union Pacific Railroad. So it was exciting to see that stuff pass through town. They parked it next to our museum, just south of town here, or north of town here. And uh, Vicks Crane came out with some equipment and transferred it to our um, museum. So it's on our track now. The locomotive, the brief history on that locomotive, it's an, made by the Alco American Locomotive Company. It's a diesel electric built in the mid-50s. And it was used by the Northern Pacific Railroad in a dual superior area. It was retired in the early 70s by the Burlington Northern at the time. And it wasn't scrapped, it was sold to uh, the Southern Minnesota Beet Sugar Cooperative out in Renville. And they used it for a number of years up until about 1998 and it suffered an electrical fire and it sidelined the locomotive. And we became aware of it, we had asked them if they'd be interested in donating it and they said, well yeah sure, just get it out of here, you can have it. And it, we knew it didn't run at the time, we had an intention to restore it. And long story short, it ended up down at, stored at Montgomery because we couldn't get to the property. We hadn't really started developing the museum out there. Like we said, 2008 was when we really started developing the museum. Um, so our goal would be for that locomotive to eventually get it. First, it's going to probably need, you can see it's, it doesn't look very, it doesn't look very pleasing right now. Um, our goal is to do some cosmetic restoration and get it repainted. So visitors, when they come to the museum, you can see it. Uh, we hope to have that running maybe in the next five years or so. Or it needs, it's all there. It needs a lot of work. It was vandalized when it was down there. Some of the wiring has been stolen and things like that. The uh, coach is uh, from the Burlington route. It was built in 1940. So to me, that looks modern. It's hard to believe that it's 84 years old. <laughs> it it doesn't look 84 years old. I mean, it looks. It needs some uh, work. Some it's stainless steel. It's been painted. It needs some cleaning up and some repairs. But I mean, to me, it looks. It looks still pretty modern. It doesn't look much different than the Amtrak train today. Okay, and then uh, coming soon, we're going to add another caboose to our pumpkin train that we have in the fall. Um, this currently is in a lady's yard up in uh, Brooklyn Park, and uh, we're working with a moving company to get that moved out there this summer. So, do um, you want to... Jeff's sort of our guy that knows all oh. the all the technical stuff. I'm just I'm an eight to bar people with all kinds of too many details. We I'm sure I could probably talk for hours just on these the caboose alone here. No, we became aware of this caboose. Uh, like George mentioned, we did do have a short caboose train. So anyone who is familiar with our operation out there, we've got a locomotive and a caboose that we run on the first Saturday of the month, May through October. And we became aware of this caboose being available last March already. It's over a year ago, um, and we went and looked at it. And it needs some new siding outside. It, it still looks pretty good, but it needs new siding. But the interior is perfect. It was in this gentleman's backyard. He was a Sioux Line Railroad employee for a number of years, oh, probably almost 40 years or better. Uh, he recently passed away, and his wife was looking to get rid of the caboose. Uh, she didn't want to donate it. We had to purchase it. And now we need to move it by truck from Brooklyn Park. But it was built in, uh, it was a 1900. And like George mentioned, it was a bobber. So I'm, I'm guess, guessing most people here aren't too familiar with the different railroad jargon and whatnot. As you can, it's hard to see from this photo, there's shadows and everything. So this caboose happens to have two sets of wheels underneath it. When we're talking about a bobber caboose, it just had one axle at each end and it was, it was about a third of the length of that. It was a very short little caboose. Uh, the Duluth Misabi and Iron Range, uh, I don't know how many people are familiar with it, but it, it was uh, kind of isolated. Basically they had one purpose, to haul iron ore from the Iron Range to Duluth. Um, so they didn't need big giant cabooses. Well, in 1910, they rebuilt it to its current configuration. They stretched the frame, put two sets of trucks under it. And uh, it ran on the railroad until the early, late, about the mid-1970s, and then it was sidelined. 
Yeah. And about 1978-ish, the railroad uh, had a fundraiser for the Duluth Railroad Museum. They retired all their old wooden cabooses and gave them to the museum and said, here, you can, you can sell them to raise money. So this fellow worked for the Sioux Line, so he had different connections, and he said, well, a, my own caboose in my backyard, I'll, <laughs> I'll buy that. So he bought it, and because of his connections, him and his sons were able to go up to Superior and hop on the caboose, and they rode it from Superior down to the Shoreham Yard at the Sioux Line, where it was offloaded onto a truck to bring to their backyard. And they only lived maybe about five miles from the railroad yard. Up, they were in Brooklyn Park. It's not far from where Shoreham is up in northeast Minneapolis. So. So here's a picture of the inside. Like Jeff said earlier, it's like mint condition inside. It's just the guy took such excellent shape. So that's why we sort of jumped at the opportunity that, okay, replace the side yarn on the outside, but, and then we have like a vintage caboose with a cupola. So uh, preservation. Um, well, I'll let you take this one too. <laughs> All right. <laughs> So this particular caboose has a uh, tie to local history. Um, I believe, sometimes I don't remember what I had for breakfast. So the name of the family is escaping me. I'm having a mental block. I want to say it's the Hen Hennis family. Is that correct? Sure. Does that sound familiar? I, yeah. they're, they're a family in Jordan. And if you're familiar with the Jordan area, it's 282. If you're heading east out of town on 282, they'll be on the left side. If you'll, uh, you're coming up the hill, and on the right side, there's a big farm with a big barn and then across the way would be their, their property. The way their property is set up, you have the house and it kind of dropped off. So this caboose sat in their backyard for over 50 years, but if you didn't know where to look, you would have never seen it. So for 50 years it was in the backyard and it was the kids' playhouse growing up and everything else. Well, a few years back, their father passed away and they, they contacted us, because we had known about this caboose and we had talked with the owner and everything, and we'd even kind of give them a hard time all the time. You gotta, you gotta bring that, you can keep it, just bring it out to the museum. Imagine riding in your own caboose at the museum. And he would say, well, that's kind of an interesting idea. Well, they knew that he was interested in what we were doing out there, so they contacted us a couple of years ago, back in uh, 2021, and said, would you be interested in our father's caboose? Well, absolutely. So they donated it to us. It needed all new siding on the outside. Uh, Vix Crane helped us move it to the museum in the summer of 2021. And so now we're in the process of rebuilding it. It's, it's, a mini, it's ran on the Minneapolis and St. Louis, so most likely it's, it's possible that several times it passed right through town here. Um, even though it's wood, it's fairly modern. Well, modern is, is most of the, is about as modern as many of the things out there we have. It's built about 1944, so, yeah, but it was built out of wood. Since it's wartime, steel is kind of restricted but the railroad needed more cabooses because it increased traffic during the wartime and everything. So we're in the process of rebuilding that and hoping to add that to our caboose train in the next couple of years. Having sat outside all this time, it had needs some work on the roof. The roof has rotted away and things like that around the stove pipe and things like that. But um, there's a picture of it so far. We've got one side resided and repainted. We're working in on the other side. And uh, we... So yeah, we're making progress on it. It takes time. Like we're we're a small group. There's not many of us that out there volunteer. But, but overall, we have what is there about 40 members, and then about about 10 active volunteers. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So restoration. This is a James J. Hill, Manitoba, built in 1880. You want to elaborate? <laughs> Yeah, so if, again, uh, for you folks that are familiar with, have been driven by the museum all the time, and um, I imagine most people's opinions probably like, does that stuff even run? It never moves when we see it driving by. <laughs> I'm sure you recognize this piece. For years, it's just sat there out there on that trailer, and it looked like some odd mobile home or something. People, th that piece alone brings people, it has brought people to the museum. They've stopped, they're like, we just came to see what the heck this was. Uh, we recently took the roof off. You probably remember it had a peaked roof if you'd driven by a lot. We took that off. So now it's starting to look like a railroad car. What's interesting about this car is, one, the fact that when we acquired it, nobody knew what it was. It was just an old railroad car. It had been up in Howard Lake as part of a home, because in the 1930s it was retired by the railway and uh, taken off the wheels and everything in the frame, and it was used as a, like a guest house on a farm up in Howard Lake. 
after we acquired it is when we started doing some research just from different clues that we found inside the car. And it turned out here it had built, we found out it was built in 1880 by Pullman for the St. Paul, Minneapolis and Manitoba Railway. So I don't know how familiar everyone is with, some, with the various railroad history on Minnesota. Uh, we found that a lot of people that visit when we say, have you heard of James J. Hill? They say, no. But if you are familiar with James J. Hill, he purchased a little railroad by the name of St. Paul and Pacific in about 1878. And they were bankrupt and they had dreams of building the railroad, a railroad to the west. Him and his associates took that railroad, reorganized the St. Paul and Pacific Railway. This car was built purposely as a business car. Now, it technically wasn't, so it's owned by the railroad. It's technically not assigned to James J. Hill. It was assigned to the St. Paul superintendent. But it was a use almost all the time by James J. Hill. Anytime he traveled, there's no business jets or anything else like that at the time. This is the business jet of the day. When he wanted, when he's going out, traveling out west as they're building towards Seattle, he goes to Jackson Street Shop and says, send, the, send it down to the depot, I'm leaving. And they'd send it to St. Paul Union Depot and off he would go. His wife had family back in uh, eastern Canada and the eastern United States. She traveled a lot in this car. Um, they loaned it out to friends. There's a bed and breakfast in Monticello that on the, in their history they mentioned that when it was the home that was built for some newlyweds that were family friends of the hills. And uh, they didn't mention Car Manitoba specifically, but they said that when they got married, the Hills loaned them their, their private car to go on their honeymoon. Well, because of the date when the, where their wedding took place, it would have been this car. So this car was used by that family to travel. They didn't say where they went. Um, yeah. As you can see in some of the prior slides, you can see the inside is well kept up or it's very pretty inside. So. Yeah, the, the woodwork and the, the bunks that come out of the berths and the stuff like that. Was there like an engine room or something in those cars? Right, so this, this was built as a private car. The railroad often had a lot of what they called office cars. So a lot of those would, would be rebuilt from, they'd take a sleeping car or something and rebuild it. This was built purposely as a private car to be used. So the way it's set up, and if you come out to the museum, you're, you're able to tour through this car, but when you first walk in where the stairway comes up on the end, there's a space that doubled as the dining room, and it's also the quarters for the steward, or the porter, it goes by both, both names. And they always had one guy that was assigned, the Hills preferred this one particular guy that, out of the dining car department, his name was Robert Miner. And they always had the same person, and he got paid a little extra over above the other dining car stewards. So that would be his quarters. There's a up, there's a berth that folds down. In fact, I think that one photo was showing that. Yeah. So you've got the upper berth, and there's a bench, and you've got cabinets for all the china and everything. And then there's a corridor. So you walk down the you'll walk down the corridor, and there's a kitchen. Then the next spot there's a there's one master bedroom that would be for James J Hill or the superintendent whoever's using that car. Then the back half of the car is set up. You remember the old Pullman cars where they. You see them in old movies and everything, how they have the seats would push together and the bunk folds down from the ceiling. You have the curtains and everything at night. So there's four of those set up. And then you've got a little observation area. So they can accommodate um, eight guests in this car, plus the master bedroom. And it's all self-contained. So it's almost like a, a motorhome on wheels. Um, I mean, they could take, they could put, they'd put it on the back of the passenger train and go wherever they needed to go, but they could set it off on a siding and it's all self-contained. They they use this quite often to go on hunting trips uh, up to Canada and out to the west. So, so and then this last year we acquired the, we have the frame for it and we acquired the trucks this last year for it. So, so that's another project that, you know, we're working at that's slowly getting the pieces together to start to reassemble it. So, then operating of railroad equipment artifacts. This is sort of our main locomotive that does most of the, the running that runs the bucket train. So. Yes, we, don't, we, don't have, we won't go through the entire history of this locomotive. You're probably tired of hearing me talk already. But the unique part of this locomotive, what's unique about this locomotive is it's maybe hard to see in here. It was last used by Northern States Power. So if you can see the little, if you guys remember Ready Kilowatt as the, uh, the mascot for Northern States Power. When Northern States Power 
now they're switching all the power plants over to natural gas now, but at one time, of course, they burned coal. So just about every power plant in Minnesota that were operated by NSP would have some type of switching locomotive to shuffle the cars around for the coal. This one operated in St. Paul at the High Bridge plant until it was retired in about 1997. What was unique about it is that was the only one that, they, that NSP painted with ready kilowatt on the side. Now other power companies use that too, so if you go to the Illinois Rare Museum, you'll see some Wisconsin Power and Light locomotives with ready, ready kilowatt on the side. Some of our volunteers will tell people, that's the only locomotive ever painted with ready kilowatt. And I say, well, get careful when you say that it's the only something of anything. <laughs> it's, it's the only one from Northern States Power that was painted that way. And that's one reason they donated it to the museum was because of the unique, uh, they were going to use it as a gate guard when they retired it at, at Riverside. And one of the, our volunteers worked at NSP and knew some of the other guys. And there were some employees that were trying to save and make sure it wouldn't get scrapped. And he said, well, these guys will actually run it. Why don't you donate it to them? The pieces all fell together, and, and that's how we wound up. That's our main motive power for our caboose train. So if you come out and see us ride the caboose train, you can actually ride on this locomotive. It's one of the few places you can actually ride in a locomotive because we're isolated on our private property. We kind of don't fall under the Federal Railway Administration rules where they're getting more strict about non-operating crew being inside locomotives when they're running. So if you come out and see us, you can... The amazing thing, just like that coach, it's hard to believe this is also 84 years old. It's built 1940. To me, this looks, this is modern locomotive, it seems to me, but... Am I still going? You're still going. Like I said, I'm just a volunteer. I've only been active there the last couple of years, so I don't have his wealth of knowledge. So They're probably getting tired of hearing me, or I'm t probably talking really fast. Getting. I definitely want to say thank you to Kristen and uh, Liza for inviting us here. I didn't say it before. We're very excited to be here and talk, have an opportunity to talk about, talk about our museum. Um, um, can I ask a question? Sure. Microphone. Okay. Okay. The James J. Hill car. Car. Yeah. Okay. So so they would go on trips and stuff with the railroad. They they attach their car to the big train. Yeah. And then then do they take the car uh, the car out when they're not using it? Right. So if it's not being used by anyone, it up. Uh, um, Dennis mentioned the Minnesota Transportation Museum. So they're up in St. Paul at the Jackson Street Roundhouse. That is part of a big com railroad complex that was up there. The Jackson Street Shops was the car shop. So most of the time when that car wasn't being used, it was sitting in the rail yard up, at, up there at Jackson Street Shop. Okay. When they would need it, a switch engine would take it down to the St. Paul Union Depot, and they would board, and they'd put it on the back of a passenger train. I would imagine occasionally a freight train, but it was usually it would be on the back of a passenger train. And yeah, because the rail network is connected nationwide, they can go wherever they want. Not only places where the Great Northern goes, they can go, I mean, to Chicago and get on a railroad and head to New York, or like I said, they would go to Canada um, to visit family. They would go out west on hunting trips. But yeah, where they get where they're going, they just push it off on a siding and it would be set out. And then they do their thing and they would live in it like a, like a rolling motel, hotel. And then when they wanted to come back, they'd put it back on a train going the other way and head back home. What luxury. That is so cool. I never, never knew that. Yeah, thank you. Is the State Society in St. Paul aware that you have the coach? Yes. They are aware of it. In fact, we were guests at the James J. Hill House just last, just past Saturday for their train days. Oh, that's great. Have you applied for the legacy grant to help in the restoration? We have not, but that's on our list to do. Yeah, I as recommend get, you do it. As we get more people kind of involved, like George mentioned, we have just have a short, a small group of people, so we kind of yeah, do yeah. what projects we can. We want to be careful when we start applying for grants so we can make sure we can complete that, but that's definitely on the list to get, that's to do some work on that car. Uh, Rick Nash, do you have any comment about that legacy grant and its application? Yeah, we have a fellow that's, uh, he, well, he, 
he lives in Duluth. I think he's in the process of him and his wife moving to town. Uh, I think in Brooklyn Park. And he's taken an interest, an active interest in working on this car. Because up until about two years ago, we hadn't done too much with it other than have it on this trailer and have it open to the public. So he's been working on it quite a bit. So I think definitely now we're going to be more serious. And we have, like George mentioned, we have uh, we recently got some wheels and we have some steel framework to reassemble. And I think in the next couple of years now, we're going to be more active about uh, looking at applying for some grants and trying to get some more people excited about working on it because just one or two people you, you can only do so much so if we had we're hoping we can find a few more people to get excited about working on it uh, one problem we have is uh, see obviously when you drive by you notice we don't have a building to work in so that's on our to-do list is to get a, a shop building put up because working on something like this outdoors once you start taking it apart it's wood and what happens to wood when it's out in the weather so you have to make sure you're covering up with tarps and things like that and that can get you spend half the day covering it up with tarps and you don't get any work done. So we just pretty much have Saturdays that we work out there. But most definitely that's that's our goal is to start looking at more grants. Yes? I would really like to hear the story of why are there no cabooses anymore? We can talk about that if you want. <laughs> Brief we could I said we can briefly talk about that if you want to. I don't I don't want I want to take people's time up there. You want to know how come there's no more cabooses on the on freight trains? So I guess the sh the short answer would be, of course, like any company, especially the railroads, they're always looking to cut costs, right? And and of course we have technology. Technology sometimes is our friend, and sometimes it's kind of our enemy as far as jobs and things like that. So the purpose of the caboose in the first place mainly was just to boil it down. To its most simple thing is for a place at the end of the train for the crew. If you think back. Years and years ago, uh, before the advent of air brakes, we go back. You got to go way back to the 1800s. Um, people would physically walk the tops of the train to apply the brakes. There would be a handbrake, and they would have to apply the brakes. So the engineer would use a whistle signal to call for brakes, and they some guys would climb out of the caboose and get up on top of the train. There might be a guy up in the locomotive that he'd go back the other way from the front. So trains were a lot shorter. They might only be. 20, 30 cars, 40 cars long because these trains today where they're a couple miles long, there'd be no way you could apply all the brakes in time to stop. So he'd whistle for brakes, they would get up and apply the brakes. So that's one, the main reason the back of the back of the train with the caboose, well, how that developed. Then with the advent of air brakes where the engineer can control the brakes from the locomotive, um, you need somebody at the back of the train still to monitor the brake pipe pressure through the train. So there's another purpose for the caboose. The caboose is also a rolling office for the conductor because as they're going along doing their work and stopping in at different towns, picking up cars, setting out cars, there's paperwork that needs to be done. They need to keep track of what, what cars they set off and when they, when they picked them up and all that sort of thing. And they still, there's no radios, so the only communication is by hand signals, waving. So that's why the typical crew was five people. There was an engineer, a fireman, the conductor, and two, a head brakeman and a rear brakeman. So when they're doing switching, the only way they can communicate is by hand signals. And a lot of times they'd have to stand on top of the rail cars to pass signals for whatever reason. So it's a dangerous job. So with the advent of radios, now they start, there's a little bit less of a reason to have the caboose. So the early radios on the train, the, the, only the work between the conductor and the engineers. So they still are using hand signals. And we're talking about the mid to late 1950s when they start getting ra train radios. Then you fast forward now to today. So it, since that time, since the 50s and radios and all kind of thing, we have more technology. And they decided, well, we don't need so many people on the crew. It's down to two. You probably heard in the news how there's arguments and discussions and legislation about the railroads want to go with one crew member. Well, I think some railroads would prefer to have no. They want autonomous trains. And they're pushing legislation to say, no, you need at least two. So right now, the typical crew is the engineer and the conductor. The conductor rides up front with the engineer and has a little desk there. to do. They still need to do that same paperwork. The reason they don't need the caboose anymore is there's only two crew members. They don't need anybody riding back there. And because of different radio and com computer technology, they just have a little box that the caboose has been replaced by. So if you ever have noticed what it... If it 
did Matt pay attention when a train's going by where we're waiting at the crossing going, is it ever going to go by? You'll notice that last car will have just a little box hanging on the couple with the blinking light. So that's doing the same thing that the crew in the caboose used to do. It's monitoring the brake pipe pressure at the back of the train and sending a signal back to the locomotive for the engineer to see. And it's carrying the markers. And so part of the rules and that's part of the rules of any train, the definition of a train when you go through the railroad's rule book is it's a locomotive or locomotive with cars that's displaying a headlight and markers. So you think about the old days when you see the caboose go by and would have marker lights hanging from the caboose. That's the markers, that's what makes it a train. So just a locomotive with the headlight going by with its headlight on to the rear, that's also a train per the rules. So that's what this box is doing. It's it's fulfilling that part of the rules, it's a marker, and it's sending that information to the engineers so they don't need the, they don't need the caboose anymore. So that was a really long story to answer your short question. <laughs> very good. It's, it, it's more complicated than I thought, <laughs> but uh, very interesting because they still had them on Montgomery Parade after 1990, 1969. They still had a caboose on that. Oh, yeah. I think it was 1985 or 86 is when... Yeah, probably the later 80s, early 90s when they started taking them off. It's when this technology t really took off with the... There's different terms for it. They call it... You'll hear the railroaders or rail fans call that little box a FRED. It's supposed to be friendly rear-end device or something like that. Um, but yeah, it's definitely not like the old... I mean, even, I remember as a little kid, it was always fun. You'd, the train would go by and you'd always wait to wave at the conductor and the brakeman. They'd be up in the cupola and, or the bay window and they'd wave. And, you know, not, now you wait and you wait and then it just uh, all it is... Uh, it's like if it's anticlimactic, you feel cheated almost or something. <laughs> so, um, and then when we're open is... Um, open the first Saturday of each month, May through October. Uh, we're open the Saturday at Dosiki weekend after the parade. And then our main event is the pumpkin train that this year is October 12th. And um, last year we had a big turnout. We had almost, what well, was about 700 people actually showed yeah. up. So it was a lot of people. So, yeah, thank God for social media. So. And then we also, uh, oh, go ahead. I want to know, is there any signage by the roads? Because actually, any time I've gone by there, I thought it was just kind of a junk pile. <laughs> I didn't know it was a museum. Oh, How would I know it was a museum? Yeah, we're working on it. We have a sign ready to go out. We haven't had, been able to get it put up yet. But we definitely, that's a comment that everybody made, and we uh, have the same comment. We need a sign so people know what it is. Because yeah. you're exactly right. Most people yeah. that even come in business, they go, we thought this was some farmer's junk. <laughs> because we, we, we definitely are aware of the fact that the stuff down in the fence, it's old wooden equipment and it's being affected by the elements because, like George said, we just have a small group of people, a small budget. You can only do so much at one time, right? So we are aware of that and we're, we're, we're always working hard to kind of improve our image out there so we don't look like a, a junkyard. Yeah. And we definitely, so signage we do, is a big thing. Yeah, we do put out a sign the day we do have trains riding. And what hours are they open on the 1st of June? I have two sons that used to work for the railroad, and they're coming down for a graduation party on the 1st of June, so they might be in. Oh, sure. Coming out. So our hours when we're open, right now we're only open the first Saturday of the month, so June 1st will be the next time we're open. And the reason for that is because, again, because we don't just have a few people, we'd love to be open every weekend. So the rest of the weekends we're out there working, so the hours will be 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. The train will be running. We're in the process right now of uh, rebuilding a lot of our track. Because so the track has been in place since 2014, and we didn't, when we put it down, we didn't have money for ballast, so it was just laid on the right-of-way. So over time, the uh, ground has been uh, doing its best to pull it, to reclaim it. So it sunk down to the ground quite a bit. So we, we need to rebuild it, and we've got some ballast up there now. If you drive by, you'll probably see a big pile of rock in the parking lot. That's new ballast for our track that we've been... So our train ride Saturday, will, it'll be running, it might be kind of short, people like, well, might say, is that it? Well, that's it for this month, but come back in the, later in the summer and it's going to be a lot longer as we keep working further south on our track. Thank you. Okay. So yeah, and then, uh, like I said, it's all volunteer basis, so we love volunteers. If you're interested in volunteering, 
uh, talk to me or Jeff, or uh, messages on Facebook. So all skill sets of We need lawnmowers. We need you know all type of people. So anybody. And then ways to uh, donate, you can go to our website. Does right. railroad still retain the ownership of the track pathway? So, yeah, so our museum is all on private property. We own 20 acres there. So when you drive by and you see there's that stuff in the fence at the south end by the motel, or it used to be a motel, I think it's apartments now, up to 252nd Street, that's our property. The rail line through town is the Union Pacific and they still own that. They run it, some people think it's abandoned because they never see the train, but it runs, right now they kind of do as needed. There's two customers left, Chart in, in New Prague and Seneca Foods in Montgomery. So Union Pacific runs once a week. Yeah, once, once or twice They'll a week. come through town and, so you have to be here at the right time, otherwise you'll think, well the train never runs through here. <laughs> um, but yes, they, they own the railway and we, our long-term goal, would be we'd love to run a tourist railroad out here on that line because it's a beautiful, it's a, it would be a beautiful ride between Montgomery and Jordan. Um, and we're working with other museums also, MTM, Jackson Street Roundhouse, we're working with them. They, you know, work out some things, but it takes time and then Union Pacific is not that friendly for um, museums or hosting that because they're a liability. So the, the property where the tracks are or were is still in the ownership of the railroad? Well, the, pro the track that we run in on is our own private property and it's track that, that we built. It, it was, didn't exist before we bought that property. Uh -huh. So that's all track that we built. So our goal, since we can't run out on the Union Pacific, is our goal is to get a loop of track built around the perimeter of our property so you have a little bit more of a longer train ride than just getting on and going back forwards and back. It is about the right size for kids, love it. We see families come back every month to ride the train because the kids are like, we gotta go ride the train. And we see plenty of kids that start crying and screaming because they say it's time to go home. <laughs> so I feel bad for the parents, but at the same time I feel excited because it's like, yep, we did our job. They, they had fun and they liked it. Um, out, outside of your property, say I had one running through my farm and it was abandoned, does the railroad still own the easement to that or not? If they officially abandon it, and it's a big process you have to go through for them to do that, they have to file with the, uh, with the state. And I'm, I'm not clear on the entire process, maybe even the federal government, to abandon a line. But once it is officially abandoned, they get that approval and it's abandoned. And they pull up the tracks. If you own property, along there and the rail line goes through your backyard, that reverts back to the property owner. Okay. So right now this line not abandoned. It runs as far as Montgomery and then south of Montgomery I think there's maybe another mile or two that's owned by Seneca Foods. But yeah, beyond that, then all that rail line, all the because this of course, as Dennis had mentioned too, that it ran all the way to uh, uh, Peoria on the M and St. L. So from here it goes through like Kilkenny and Waseca and Albert Lee and on to Mason City. I, uh, I, when I was doing my study for St. Thomas, I read a story about a Parnell Sullivan. He happens to relate it to the Hollerans, of course, but he served as a um, cook the head chef on one of these trains that left Superior. He spent a career doing that. It was a fascinating read for sure. Have you fellas ever thought about a fundraiser out there, having a car and serving breakfast or something as a kind of a fundraiser and getting some help and then inviting people in? I understand where you want to go with this, I really do. Because a lot of these places when they're abandoned they become trails going through your backyard that you may or may not want. So uh, that's all I have to say. I have something a little bit to add in the end. Oh, sure. sure. Yeah, we've discussed a number of different um, ideas on fundraisers and different ways we can get raise awareness and get more people excited and involved and aware of what we're doing out there. Yeah. Sometimes that's why it we're comes here today, so, yeah. What's that? That's why we're here today. So. Oh, that's one reason. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. One reason we're here today. Yeah. Um, and that's definitely good ideas. That we've talked about things like that. Could we have a, some type of dinner or fundraiser dinner or things like that? A lot of it comes down to, of course, we're all volunteers and we work 
regular jobs during the day. We need to find those few right, retired people that have the time and the energy to kind of plan these kind of things and carry them out. That's, that's been a big thing for us is because what, when you're working eight hours a day, it's hard to do some of this stuff, especially to make those contacts that you need to plan these things. They also, you need to make those during the day. So sometimes your employer isn't quite as excited about uh, when you spend your work time working on museum time. We do what we can, but. So. Is there any other questions? Does anybody, if you can raise your hand, I can come over with the microphone. I, I couldn't hear. Do you have your ticket spot for the Borealis train to Chicago yet? Oh, our yeah. ticket spot for the Borealis train. <laughs> Not yet, but, the, but uh, that is exciting that like to see that added. That's uh, been a long time coming to add that second train. Any other questions? Okay, I want to thank Jeff and George very much for coming out today. They put on a wonderful presentation. Uh, they will be available here um, if you guys want to ask more questions. And again, thank you everybody for coming out. You're welcome to come up and um, view some of the images they have up here, more information about Gopher State Railway Museum and the different programs they have. And once again, thank you. Also, there is a couple flyers for floating around. Thank you, Sheila. Um, these flyers are floating around. Uh, we will post this on our social media. There will be an email going out, a couple of different things. But if you are interested in more Historical Society events, just take a quick picture with your phone, and uh, we'd love to see you out next summer. Thanks, everybody.